Thank you, Charlie. Hi, everyone. I'm Juliet Homer from PNNL and happy to be with you for the best for last session here on um, inter-regional transmission planning, why it's important and how do we make it happen. So we've got an excellent panel for you today. We have five panelists and they are all here in person. Um, so uh, as Charlie said, we've heard a lot about inter-regional uh, or the need for transmission and the need for inter-regional transmission. And so in this session, we're going to talk about why it's important, but we're also going to focus on how do we make it happen. So after we hear from the speakers, we'd love to uh, have a discussion, have some questions uh, with you about how do we make it happen. Our first speaker today will be Peter Markison, who is the Senior Director at EnergyNet. EnergyNet is the state-owned Danish transmission and system operator. Peter focuses on international cooperation and sharing the Danish experience with the integration of renewable energy to accelerate the global green transition. So after Peter, we'll hear from Hamodi Hindi. He's with the US Department of Energy and he'll talk about DOE's Building a Better Grid initiative. Uh, Hamodi is a transmission planning engineer with DOE's Grid Deployment Office. And prior to joining DOE, he was a transmission planner with the Bonneville Power Administration, where he led reliability studies and transmission expansion studies. Then we'll hear from Patrick Brown, who's a researcher at NREL, and Patrick will share with us some learnings to date from the National Transmission Planning Study. Patrick's work focuses on improving the representation of renewable energy, transmission, and energy storage in power system planning models to support rapid decarbonization. All right, so after Patrick, we'll hear from Jian Fu, who's the program manager for grid integration in the Wind Energy Technologies Office at DOE. And Jian leads the collaborative research, development, and demonstration and deployment of technologies to ensure a cost effective, cyber secure, reliable, and a resilient power grid with increasing levels of wind. And then finally, we'll hear from Hassan Hyatt, who's the regional transmission planning manager for AEP. Um, Hassan leads regional, interregional, and competitive aspects of transmission planning in PJM, MISO, and SPP footprints. So with that, we will get started and turn over to Peter. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today and for the very well organized uh, conference and also for the good presentations that I've heard the last few days. Uh, I'm from Denmark, Europe. So uh, uh, it is a very different setup in the US as compared to Europe, but it's, it's the same challenges, the same problems. And uh, uh, it is important to share how we do so we can inspire each other and uh, hopefully find uh, new new solutions that uh, can make it happen. So um, my headline today is uh, actually uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, NSWE minimum inter TSO transmission capacity requirements. But to understand why is it that we have a minimum capacity requirements for our exchange of electricity across cross borders, uh, I will dig a bit into the history of uh, uh, the European uh, electricity system and the regulation that we have. Um, yeah, I used the uh, key arrows instead. Um, yes, yeah, so, but, but just uh, say Denmark, uh, we are in the Nordic, uh, one of the Nordic countries in Northern Europe. We are uh, operating the development uh, and develop the transmission grid for both electricity and gas in, uh, uh, in, in Denmark. We have the responsibility for the balance both day-to-day -day, but also the long-term planning uh, and we are owned by the Danish Ministry of Climate and Energy Utilities and a non-profit organization. So, 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 so we have a number of the tasks that you have split between different uh, institutions in, in, in the US. So of course that in some cases make it easier for us to, uh, to plan and uh, build but it might not always be a challenge to uh, have a lot of responsibilities in the same organization. Sometimes it's also good to have the competition between institutions and organizations. So uh, we are very well interconnected to um, our neighboring countries. Uh, we have a peak uh, load of around seven gigawatt, but we also have seven gigawatt of uh, uh, tie line to our neighboring countries. Um, this, uh, one thing it, it is for historical reason, we had the first tie line to Sweden back in 1915 and uh, uh, to Germany, we have always been connected and uh, uh, to Germany, we built the first HVDC link in 1956. Um, Denmark is actually two different synchronous areas where Eastern Denmark belongs to the Nordic synchronous areas and Western Denmark to the 
to the continent. So it has actually been necessary for us to uh, be, be connected to be able to have the security of supply and also there were an advantage being connected with the uh, Nordic uh, hydropower and we then had the, the thermal power. But now things are changing. We have 50% of renewables in our energy system, mainly from uh, wind, but also solar uh, is increasing very fast. We have plans for a lot of more wind and uh, uh, as you can see the yellow uh, wind turbines in the sea, that is our uh, energy islands uh, that uh, we, they are politically decided. We have started the planning where we expect three gigawatt in uh, uh, Eastern uh, Denmark and up to uh, uh, 10 gigawatt uh, in uh, Western Denmark in the North Sea uh, that will then be connected both to Denmark but also to uh, neighboring countries. Uh, because there is, is a very large demand for renewable electricity in, 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 in Europe, mainly caused by, say, the energy crisis, the war in Europe, where we need to uh, uh, stop using Russian gas and then have uh, green gas instead, uh, importing LNG, among others, for you, from, from, from you, from here in the USA. So, so thank you for that. So, um, so, so there is really a need for, for renewables. So, so it's not a question of whether it's competitive. It's just a question of how can we build it as cheap as possible. So, so that is, is the, the, the agenda that we have. So, um, so, so why is it uh, important with uh, uh, interregional transmission? Um, uh, there are three overall reasons. One is accelerated green transition. Uh, so when you have interregional transmission, you reduce portrayment and you also reduce CO2 emissions because you can have more uh, renewables in your system. Then it's uh, security of supply. Uh, we see that uh, in, in a system with a lot of renewables, then there is uh, lower risks for uh, energy not served or for uh, loss of uh, load expectations, it improves. Also, you have access to uh, balancing resources. Uh, and then of course, there is the reduced dependency on the imported fuels. And then finally, there is also the affordability of, of the energy. Uh, what we see in, in, in Europe uh, is that we have an annual uh, gain of around five to nine billion euro in reduced production costs. Uh, and, and, and above that, we then also have, uh, say, cheaper electricity prices that gives us an extra around three billion euro per, per year as well. So, so it, it is quite a large amount of money that uh, we can save here because of our interregional transmission uh, capacity. So, so how did we make it happen? Um, well, uh, uh, say on, on, on European level, um, we have the framework grid codes. They, they set the system operation for uh, uh, all TSOs in Europe. Uh, it also, uh, say we are coordinating among the TSOs in Europe. We are 39 TSOs. We are coordinating and our uh, long-term planning. It, it's not something that we then need to uh, follow afterwards, but at least we are coordinating. Um, uh, uh, so, so we have a, a plan with our neighboring countries that we can use for national decisions. And then uh, uh, maybe most important of all is our common European electricity markets. I will get back to that. Uh, then on national level, uh, that's where we have the implementation of the grid codes. We do uh, do that. And then there is also the national approvals. So say the EU commission uh, do not take any decisions on what to be built. They can give grants, but they don't uh, decide anything. Then on TSO level, where we are quite unbundled between production and uh, transmission and uh, the commercial part and the, the, the distribution uh, companies, uh, there are quite clear roles and uh, responsibilities for who should do what, and also who should take the initiative to build transmission capacity between countries. And then also uh, through the electricity markets, we have a very good financial incentive for cross-border uh, transmission. But, but to give some background on uh, uh, why is it that we then have transmission capacity, how is it handled, then it's important to, to look at how are we organized in, in, in Europe. Um, and it is today, uh, we have uh, five synchronous areas with the, the two islands of uh, England and Ireland. Then we have the continental Europe and we have the Nordics and then the Baltic countries. And where the Baltic countries would synchronize with the, uh, the Europe in, in, in the coming years. Then each, uh, uh, what well, the general rule is that, that each uh, uh, country is also the same uh, uh, low frequency uh, control area. Uh, and also each country have their own TSO and each uh, TSO then have their own market price area. So there is a fit between this. There is a number of exemptions. 
for example, Denmark, where we have two price areas and we also have, uh, we are part of two different uh, LFC areas. But in general, uh, this is the setup. And then you have the market price areas um, where uh, you see the colors here, they show where you have the low and the high prices. And um, in this electricity market we have is uh, something that has been developed over the last uh, 20 years. And together with the electricity market, we have then also developed the system of raising grid codes and also the connection codes uh, um, so that we have the same framework regulation. It's not specifically saying what we should do, but it, it, it's telling us for what areas should we have regulation and what should be the overall framework for, for, for doing that. And um, uh, that, that is something that has been developed over 20 years. But what, what started this development was uh, that from, from the European uh, 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 Commission, they saw that there was a large benefit if we could share or exchange electricity. Each time they saw a difference in price, they also saw benefit for exchanging electricity so that you will have an overall lower electricity price. But to exchange electricity and have the, the almost the same price in all of, uh, of Europe, you need a transmission capacity. So, so what they are doing is that, that based on the uh, grid codes, they say uh, uh, they should, we, we should make as, as much capacity available as possible on this transmission uh, capacity that we have between the countries so that um, you will be, uh, as much as possible have the same price because there is a gain on that. So the focus was actually on the electricity price. What we then have seen afterwards is that there then also is a, a, a benefit on the security of supply, uh, both for uh, the balancing and also for the reserves in, in our system, especially with the energy crisis that we see at the moment. Uh, there have actually been no discussion on whether we should reduce capacity on uh, the transmission uh, lines between the, the, the countries. It has actually been the opposite where we have said, we should keep as much open as possible because we all gain from uh, being able to exchange electricity between the countries because it makes it cheaper for, for all of us. So, so, so that is where they started. And, and uh, what is very important to have in mind is that the whole idea behind the electricity market is to exchange as much electricity as possible. And then there is ASA, that is uh, uh, the regulator, the European regulator, they are then also monitoring this implementation and especially that the benefits that we expect, the many million billion euros that I mentioned, that, we are, that they are actually materializing. So, so there is this uh, agency that is looking after that. Then we have NSUI, and that is the cooperation between the uh, 39 TSOs in, in, in Europe, where we have uh, developed the grid codes uh, and we keep uh, adapting them. We also do the long-term grid planning coordination, and then there also is some R&D coordination. And, and actually also a, a new thing is that they are also doing uh, security of supply assessments. Uh, um, um, so, so actually as, as TSO, we don't, we don't do any security of supply assessment anymore because it does not make sense for us because we are so dependent on our neighboring countries. So, so now it's done on, on, uh, uh, in a European co uh, cooperation. So. Then on a uh, country level, um, there you set the level of security of supply. You say, how, how much security of supply do we want in, in, in each country? Um, uh, so that, that is not something that is decided uh, on European level. That, that's still the national decision. Also on what's the subsidies for renewables uh, uh, and approval of tariffs, tariffs, and also the agreements and uh, approval of new uh, uh, tie lines, new interconnectors. Then as TSO, we have the system operation and balancing, the ownership and development of grid, and uh, we are then tariff financed, um, but we are also uh, financed by these congestion rents. Uh, and that is, uh, say, the differences in prices between the countries where when you exchange electricity, that difference is the congestion rent. And that is something we can keep as a, a TSO and normally it's around 200 to 300 million dollars for us that we get each year as TSO in congestion rents. What we earn on exchanging electricity. So, um, and then finally, uh, because we are so dependent on each other, there have now been established a number of regional coordination centers to support uh, cross-border system operation. So, uh, so this, this is the, the, the background, the whole framework that is uh, 
the Hilton framework that, that is, is giving us the incentive to actually exchange electricity between the countries. So just to, to uh, go down and, and give some examples of how, how this works in, in, in uh, practice. Uh, on the one hand, <clears throat> we have the interregional planning where we do these uh, 10 year network development plan between the 39 TSOs in, in Europe, where we go and look at, at uh, uh, all the potential new transmission lines that could be built. Yeah. The way it works is that we as TSO, but it could also be a, a private company that could give a suggestion to uh, uh, those developing this uh, plan and saying these projects should be included and then also then be looked, looked at and calculated on whether they give a social uh, uh, economic benefit. So, so there are often uh, two, 300 different projects proposed. Uh, uh, it could also, now, now it's also been uh, increased with uh, uh, storage projects and we also see very large uh, uh, hydrogen production projects as well being included in, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in the plan. And then we have uh, ASA, uh, this uh, regulatory agency. They, they are uh, monitoring, and what you can see on the, on the figure to the right above, uh, we don't have to see the numbers, but it, it shows the different, uh, the number of the different transmission lines in, in Europe and uh, how much capacity is made available to the market. So some are doing very well, uh, they are green, and others, they're not doing so well. And, and the rule is that a minimum of 70% of the capacity should made, be made available. And then the figure below, it, it shows uh, how much uh, of the transmission capacity that is actually used in the day ahead, the intraday and the balancing markets, where it shows that with the blue one, that, that day ahead, uh, that, that's the top one, works very well. Whereas balancing, there we could actually still improve quite a lot by using our transmission capacity for balancing. And then there is the security of supply assessment uh, where uh, that is made uh, twice every year, uh, where it looked at where do we have a, a good uh, a level of uh, loss of load expectations. Uh, the Nordics are relative green, uh, whereas uh, continental Europe is, is more and more yellow. Uh, so, so that is something that is done. And, and then we can see how we, we depend on, on each other. And then also as a new thing, as mentioned, uh, hydrogen will, uh, is actually also part of, of uh, the future uh, uh, network development plan, as well as gas already, natural gas uh, uh, already is also a, a part of the, the network plan. So, so we also try to do this holistic planning now with gas, electricity, and, and, and hydrogen. So yeah, so that, that was the very short introduction to how we do in Europe. And, and I think the main, uh, two main, uh, 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 two main uh, uh, recommendations from my side is to uh, uh, say focus on uh, the, the transmission capacity. And, and then you need also a, a, a federal clear uh, um, uh, policy objective to, to do it. Otherwise it would not happen. So that, that, that's one thing. And the other one is you, you need some kind of financial incentive. Otherwise you will not build transmission capacity between the different regions. And we have done that through the market. It, it can also be done in other ways, but a clear political objective to do it and uh, a financial incentive then of course, uh, it, it takes time. We have used uh, more than 20 years to where we are now. So uh, wish you the best on that. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. All right, that's good. Hopefully all can hear me well. I'm, I'm glad uh, this, this uh, at the end of the day here because inter-regional transmission is quite a incendiary topic and brings out the worst in regions from what we found. So I hope everyone heard and exhausted themselves uh, debating last night at the happy hour. <laughs> I, think, I think I saw that, so I'm a little relieved. Here we go. I'm gonna go pretty quick because I, I do wanna get to the discussion. That's my favorite part of, uh, especially for interregional. So anyway, so building a better grid initiative, what's DOE doing about interregional transmission? Well, we're doing a lot of things. There's a lot of engagement happening. Uh, with states, tribes, stakeholders, federal uh, agencies, uh, other groups, RTOs. Uh, the national planning study that Patrick's going to talk about in a second here, uh, we've got a technical review committee that has a, a modeling subcommittee that has representation from each of the first four to 1,000 planning regions and generation developers and transmission developers. We've got a, a governmental subcommittee that has representation from Nehru and Nazio, the state energy offices, utility commissioners. We've got an environmental land use uh, group 
We've got the representation from the Army Corps, from NRDC, uh, other folks. Um, so, so quite a broad engagement. And then we've been working with existing community groups. I mean, ESIG has been great. Debbie's been supporting us a lot. Thank you, Debbie, for, for helping our kickoff webinar we, we had back in March, wherever you are. Uh, always have great stuff. Um, and other groups, NETF, EPRI has been supporting us. So lots of engagement. And we really think that engagement is a key to help catalyze interregional transmission is that deep level engagement right from the beginning. Okay, so there's engagement. So building a better good, we've got actually three different studies going on right now. And Jean's, uh, Jean's gonna talk about the Atlantic offshore wind study. There's also the transmission needs study. Now that is, uh, the goal there is separate from the national transmission planning study. It's a quicker study. It's going to be published next spring and actually it's going out for comment this coming January. That is tied back to the uh, Energy Policy Act in 2005 and that's tied to national interest electric transmission corridor designation. Um, and what that's about, although there's a recent change um, from the uh, IIJA law that just passed that can now be a forward looking study, whereas before it was focused on present day congestion, now it can be forward looking congestion. And uh, what Adria Brooks is doing at DOE is, is collecting a bunch of already published modeling results from around 40 industry and lab studies and other studies and analyzing that to, to synthesize it to derive new results of where congestion might be now and in the future. And then that'll help contribute to potential designation of, again, national interest electric corridors. Um, of course, we hope that would be a last resort, obviously. Um, all right, so uh, those are some of the studies going on. And the national planning study, I won't say too much more about that since Patrick's going to talk about it. So financing tools, what do we have? We've got uh, transmission facilitation program. So I'll dig into that in the next few slides here. There's a smart grid investment program, so $3 billion. Uh, that, that's looking at things like vehicle to grid uh, pilots and things like that. Uh, grid resilience, so that's for states, tribes, and utilities. The utilities part is about $2.5 billion. Uh, and again, that, that's focused on things like uh, proven local resilience. So not necessarily tried to interregional transmission. Could be an extra transformer to improve your N minus one minus one resilience or something like that. Uh, so loans, there, there's a lot of loan opportunities. Um, this last bullet is new and it's from the Inflation Reduction Act. The rest of this stuff is from the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act from, from last January. but. This last one is from the Inflation Reduction Act that uh, I'm, I'm very glad Charlie spent some time digging into that at the beginning of this meeting because I really think it is transformative and, and he's right, we all haven't really absorbed the nature of that, but the, um, the phase out of that is so incredible how, how long it could potentially last. But anyway, uh, from that, we've got 760 million to help support transmission siting and that's going to support uh, local, local siting. So state siting uh, needs and county siting needs to help uh, with staff and things like that to help facilitate those processes. And then more generally transmission permitting. So we're trying to streamline uh, federal processes and then also uh, improve public private partnerships in that area. And I talked about the, the need study contributing to designation of national corridors. Um, the, this last piece transmission R and D. So that's, that's going on. That's got some extra funding, although that's continuation of, of longstanding programs, things like looking at the flexible transformers. And of course, DOE supported uh, dynamic line ratings and is a big proponent of that. All right, so let me talk a little bit about this facilitation program. So this is a, a $2.5 billion uh, program. I know that's just a drop in the bucket for transmission. You know, hopefully this is sort of a pilot phase and depending how successful it is, it'll, it'll get 2.5 billion. And there's really three things we can do with it. Capacity contracts. So there the, the government might step in and say, okay, if your project's only 40% subscribed and you need it to be 60% subscribed to make it viable, maybe we'll step in and buy 20% of the capacity or something like that. Uh, the limits to that are we can buy up to 50% of capacity of a single project for up to 40 years. Now, obviously we wanna be on the lower end of both of those. We'd be much happier to buy 10% for like five years or something like that. Because the, the goal is it should be a revolving fund. We wanna look for projects that are not a slam dunk because uh, that can take care of itself on its own, but we also don't want those air ball projects. Uh, we want something where it's like a brick and then we, we come in and kind of tap it in and then get our money back in a little bit and find the next uh, shot that almost went in. 
so that's the goal there with those capacity contracts, a revolving fund. So we can get as much as we can out of that 2.5 billion. Uh, uh, another thing we can do besides capacity contracts is public private partnerships. Um, and that won't start until, until later on. Uh, and then also loans is always an option. So let me talk a little bit more about some of the, those options. So again, for the capacity contracts uh, eligibility, any new project that's a thousand megawatts or more, um, or it could be an upgrade of an existing line. Uh, the upgrade would have to be 500 megawatts or more. So just some details there. It doesn't have to be a new project. Um, and then also we don't we don't want to leave out our friends in Hawaii and Alaska. So if, if they're upgrading their microgrids, they're making connections of isolated microgrids. It's eligible for this uh, transmission facilitation funding as well. So project. Uh, prioritization, right? There's a number of things we're looking at. So if a project takes advantage of an advanced technology, uh, that that could help with this prioritization. Uh, also, if it improves reliability and resilience, which I was trying to think, what's an example of a transmission line that doesn't do that? I was hard pressed, so I don't know how meaningful that is, but maybe to the degree that it does it would help with the prioritization. Uh, Inter-regional transfer capacity, so that's the topic of this panel. So again, that, that would help prioritize which projects might get selected. And then of course, the administration has their 100% clean electricity by 2035 goal. So again, a, a project that would help accelerate that uh, decarbonization would also help with the priority. Um, so that's a little bit on that. And then slightly more, again, what I'm, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, we're not looking for those airball projects. We, we wanna find projects that are, are likely to succeed, but also unlikely to succeed and as timely a manner without our help, right? So this isn't, we're, we're giving out money to everybody. It's, it's people who are projects that actually need a little bit of acceleration uh, added to them. And again, we're, we're trying to recover the cost quickly. So there, there's gonna be a whole bunch of analysis we'll try and do to help identify that. And that's still being fleshed out exactly how that's gonna happen. Uh, this national planning study will be uh, a piece of contributing to help picking these projects, but it's definitely not going to be the only piece, and it probably won't even be the, the, the major piece of it, but it'll be a contributing factor. But again, there'll be uh, other analysis we'll do that'll be more granular. Okay, so the timeline. Yeah, this is, I think, my last slide on, on the facilitation program. So later this fall, actually in November, we're going to issue our phase one, so that will be an RFP for capacity contracts. And then sometime next year, uh, in the first half of next year, we'll do phase two. So that'll be capacity contracts and then loans and, and public private partnerships. Uh, all right, so I think I want to keep going pretty quick here. Yeah, so I just have one slide on the national planning study to sort of tee it up for Patrick. Um, what are the objectives of our study? Well, we want to focus on interregional transmission and, and national transmission. We think the individual regions are doing pretty good on, on transmission within their region. You know, all the regions we've talked to so far across the country, it's, it's pretty rare that interregional transmission gets evaluated at, at all, let, let alone you know, moving forward to the build stage. And so we really want to focus on that interregional transmission. And of course, uh, focus on interregional that accelerates decarbonization while maintaining system reliability. We also want to emphasize that the resilience piece, uh, the benefits there. So it's not just about decarbonization here. So this second one's really important. It gets back to our, our stakeholder engagement. Uh, we want to complement existing planning processes. We're not looking, I was talking to Jordan yesterday and he, uh, he's saying, yeah, the way you guys named it, it sounds like DOE is going to run a study, develop a plan of service, and build a bunch of transmission lines. Uh, and that's sound, that sounds pretty scary, but we really wanna complement existing planning processes uh, by having a long going dialogue with all those existing processes. And so that's what I'm hoping part of this panel is gonna be about today. And we've already had quite a bit of uh, really good engagement, um, but part of a challenge of national planning is what is the role of national planning? Like we, don't, we don't have a, a recurring process already. What would the recurring process look like? So our deep engagement is really important for us to, to complement those studies. Um, and, and then the last thing we want to identify a viable efficient option, right? We're not looking for caricatures of projects. We want actually to catalyze real builds that really happen. And so how, how can we do that? Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, that's, I think the end of my, my slides.
you know, I think to get to Juliet's question of why do we want interregional transmission, I think Peter did a pretty good job identifying you know, uh, reliability benefits and accelerating decarbonization and, and all that. And I, I think intuitively for most of the technical people here, it, it's, it's fairly obvious the benefits of, of the right interregional transmission. Uh, the how is a lot harder and I, that's where we really need a change model on how to, to get this done. I think Rob pointed out yesterday, right, the, the, the New York study we looked at, it's really expensive to decarbonize in an island. And so I, to me, I think the how is we need to find a compelling way to illustrate that value of if you add interregional transmission in the right place, not only is it good for the nation as a whole, you know, there's a national optimal, but people don't seem to care too much about that in our conversations. What we really need to illustrate in the how is how, how is it compelling to each individual region by themselves that if they go it alone, they themselves would be much worse off than if they participated in the appropriate interregional transmission. So that's really the how uh, that we want to focus on. And it's hard too, right? Because I think was it was Arnie uh, in his, actually Monday morning, he had in our capacity expansion workshop that uh, um, Aaron put on, that was really great. He pointed out the challenge of capacity expansion modeling, right? Uncertainty. Um, uh, uncertainty, imprecision, and agency, and that, you know, imprecision in the model, uncertainty about all the futures and inputs, and then the agency, right, there's no central decision maker. I think that's a great description, not only of capacity expansion, but of the challenge of interregional planning. And so how do we address all of those? All right, and we'll, we'll get to that in the conversation. So thank you all. All right, um, well, thank you for the introdu introduction and thanks Modi for setting the stage. Um, so I'll be talking about some of our learnings to date from the National Transmission Planning Study. Skip over the um, objectives of the study. I will just note that there's a large team involved both at NREL and PNNL, um, the largest team that I've been involved with uh, in my time uh, at, at NREL. Um, and it, in a similar note, it's there are also many models involved in this study. I mean, as you, as you would expect, if we're trying to understand the value of transmission at a national level, um, it, we can't just do it with a single capacity expansion model. Um, the results I'll be talking about today are just confined to that uh, results of the Reed's capacity expansion model, um, but the um, plan for the study is to link it to a series of operational models, including nodal production cost and power flow and dynamics, as well as resource adequacy model. And all that is coupled again with an economic analysis. Um, so uh, stay tuned for more of that, but today I'll just be focusing on the zonal capacity expansion part. So uh, for this part of the study, we're trying to focus on what we think are the, the major axes that could influence future uh, transmission deployment in the US and the value of that deployment. Um, so at the, so to start with, we're looking at four different kind of frameworks for how transmission expansion could happen across the US. The kind of base case is the limited expansion case where only within the per quarter 1000 regions um, can there be expansion and only at a, um, a limit based on the average expansion over the past 10 years. Where we allow unconstrained expansion of uh, transmission between our reads zones um, within the three interconnects, but not across the interconnects. There's an LCC or line commutated converter case where we pick about a, a dozen lines um, that we've um, picked from other previous runs of the model that could add a lot of value. These are long range point to point uh, DC lines as well as connections across the interconnects. And then finally, the real macro grid scenario is a VSC or voltage source converter case where we allow a multi-terminal architecture um, linking all the 134 zones in the model. In addition to that, the two very important axes are the assumed demand trajectory and then the emissions constraint that's applied across the US. So for demand growth, we have a low trajectory based on more or less the um, EIA annual energy outlook, and then a high trajectory, which is on the path towards economy-wide uh, decarbonization. Then on decarbonization, we have current policies. At the most aggressive end, there's the 100% by 2035 administration target. And then sort of in the middle, still quite aggressive, is a 90% by 2035 emissions reduction, and then 100% by 2045. This study is not a policy study, um, so I won't spend a lot of time on uh, the implications of IRA, but we do uh, need to note it just because it has such a large impact on our, on our results. So I'll talk about that briefly. And then finally, just to acknowledge, there's a lot of uncertainty um, when we're looking out to 2050 in a, in a low carbon system. 
Um, they're basic things like uh, the cost of you know wind and solar and uh, batteries, um, the price of, of gas or hydrogen, and then also uncertainty about what technologies will be available at large scale. So we have sensitivities looking at whether or not um, CCS or new nuclear or nuclear SMR or direct air capture are available. Um, and then finally, some kind of deeper uncertainties about um, what climate trajectory we end up on. So we include uh, climate impacts on hydropower availability and thermal uh, capacity in summer. Um, and then a kind of many challenges scenario where we look at what would happen if a lot of things go wrong. So um, if you can't add CCS or no nuclear, there's limited avail avail uh, availability of um, siting for renewables and then high hydrogen price as well as climate impacts. And so I'll kind of touch on these different areas through the, through the talk. So to start, um, no big surprise here, but um, the IRA policies have a large effect on, on power system emissions um, in, our, in our modeling. Um, so I'm showing here the historical emissions as these white circles and then the projected future emissions. Um, the range across all those sensitivities is shown by the gray bar and then our four core transmission scenarios are the, the colored lines. Um, so a couple of important things to note here, um, as Charlie mentioned, there uh, is this um, built-in phase out to the tax credits that is not defined up front. Um, it's either 2032 or the year in which emissions fall 75% below 2022 um, electric power sector emissions. So that's the horizontal dotted line. And then we've got our 100 by 2035 and 90 by 2035 trajectories. Um, so the first thing to note is there is a lot of uncertainty. I mean, there's um, uh, looking in the mid 2030s, you know, about a factor of three uncertainty uh, across these sensitivity cases. So um, there, any of these possible sensitivities are, 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 are certainly possible. So I, I do wanna um, keep, keep an eye on that um, uncertainty. Um, that being said, in the mid 2030s, there is a large impact of transmission, um, almost a halving uh, of emissions between the limited case and then the VSC case. Um, but that's where it starts to get messy because of this interaction with the endogenous phase out trigger. So as you would um, expect, scenarios that reduce their emissions the most quickly. So in our case, that's the macro grid scenario ends up triggering the phase out earlier than cases that are limited in, in, in transmission. So that means that the tax credits for wind and solar expire more quickly, and then you get a rebound to where in the end, the microgrid case ends up as more emissions just because you got to enjoy the uh, tax credits for less time and uh, the eventual retirement of the initial tranche of wind investments combined with load growth means that you're um, ending up as higher emissions. So that's, that's very messy. Um, since we don't want to, the policy to be varying alongside all the transmission assumptions, there's two different directions you could take. Um, kind of the conservative case in the middle is saying, let's assume the IRA uniformly phases out in 2032. And the more ambitious case would be, say, we um, are able to extend it indefinitely. Um, for the rest of the slides, I'll be using this more conservative central case where we're just assuming IRA starts to phase out in 2032. And that's the year when we cross that 75% threshold on the path towards zero carbon by 2035. All right, so starting to look at the uh, capacity results, I'm showing here on the bottom left, the transmission capacity. Um, Reads is a zonal model, and so the units here are um, terawatt miles where we measure the characteristic distance between our zones and multiply that by the zonal capacity, and then the capacity uh, of various generation types in the model. There is significant growth um, both in transmission and uh, clean generation technologies. Um, so about 20 to 70% growth in uh, total transmission capacity, um, and then maybe five or six X growth in solar, and then hundreds of gigawatts of, store of wind, and then about hundred gigawatts of storage as well. Um, that being said, there uh, isn't, uh, well, the fossil capacity without carbon capture does persist, um, even though the capacity factors are dropping a lot given the generous incentives for renewables. Um, they do st stick around to provide firm capacity. And then um, once the tax credits inspire, uh, expire, they start to, to come back. Um, so the IRA, even though it does have a large impact, it doesn't get you um, to zero and you still have hundreds of gigawatts of fossil around. So now I'll quickly walk through um, this scenario matrix um, on our way up to that economy-wide uh, uh, trajectory towards, towards zero carbon, the high demand in the 100 by 2035 case. So uh, here, starting with the low demand at 100 by 2035, um, you can see, as you would expect, um, a uh, significant additional growth in transmission and clean generation technologies. Now we're up to about a doubling of the original 150 terawatt miles of capacity in the DC cases, and then an extra three to 400 gigawatts of solar and uh, additional hundreds of gigawatts of, of wind and storage. Um, the biggest change is that retirement of fossil capacity in 2035 to meet the zero carbon target. 
Um, so uh, that is, um, at least in reeds that are kind of central cost assumption, mostly replaced by hydrogen turbines in the upper right. Um, but there is a lot of uncertainty about the relative costs of hydrogen, TCS, and so forth. So I don't want to put too much emphasis on that, um, just to note that it is um, forced by that zero carbon policy. Now, going from there to the high demand case, you actually get a larger jump in uh, clean generation capacity going from low demand at 100% to high demand at 100% than you got just from going to 100% at our current demand trajectories. Um, so you've just about doubled the wind capacity in the upper center. Um, now you're up at about 3x of the current transmission capacity in the DC cases and about 2x in the AC case, um, and then some additional growth of, of storage and, and so forth. So we do see um, in this high demand by 100% case, um, a little bit of growth of nuclear in the limited transmission case, that's the, the blue line, um, but for the most part, um, it's fairly flat across our scenarios. So one interesting thing to note, you know, you might say, oh, this is just 100% and that's, uh, you know, quite difficult. Um, it is interesting to note if we relax that to 90%, um, then, which is what I'm showing on this slide, so 90 by 2035, still high demand. The growth of transmission, wind, solar, battery storage basically looks the same. Um, so as has been noted, there's a lot of uncertainty in the last 10% of emissions reduction, but the first 90% is, for the most part, going to be delivered by wind, solar, storage, and transmission. Um, and so whether you're shooting for 90 or 100, you really can't get out of needing to interconnect two plus terawatts of wind and solar um, to the system. Um, so we do see, you know, you could decarbonize with limited interregional transmission. It would be more expensive. You would um, be installing more nuclear and so forth, but you really can't decarbonize without um, solving this interconnection challenge and, and adding an extra 2,000 or so gigawatts of wind and solar to the grid. Um, to the same point, um, we see that um, now looking at the different sensitivity cases, this is showing the 2050 generation mix for our four central transmission cases and then the 14 extra sensitivities. Um, the important things to look at here are the, the blue for wind generation and then the yellow and orange for solar, is that across the whole uh, collection of sensitivity cases and transmission assumptions, um, the majority of decarbonization is always delivered by wind and solar. Um, so in our most limited case, the limited siting with limited transmission, we get about 60% of the generation mix from wind and solar. But in all the others, it's between 70 and 80% with an average um, around 80% um, in the transmission expansion cases. And so again, um, you uh, can't really get out of needing to install these um, thousands of gigawatts of, of wind and solar. Um, in the last few slides, I'll start to look at the, the map. So showing what the, this transmission expansion looks like um, across the US system. Um, here, focusing on the 100% by 2035 case, showing our four transmission systems, the new transmission at the zonal resolution that's added by 2050. Um, we see that it, aside from the limited case, um, we get transmission expansion across the US, but the highest density um, is in the Midwest. So between these uh, highest quality wind resources and demand centers in the East. And that's true across both the AC expansion case and then our kind of point to point LCC case, as well as that multi-terminal macro grid. And it's kind of interesting, both the LCC and the VSC cases are uh, using transmission in kind of the same way. Um, if you look closely, we show the um, VSC converter capacity as the, the width of these circles. Um, and so you're, you're getting this multi-terminal design where you're not building, building a lot of edges. Um, and so whether you do that in point-to-point -point LCC or multi-terminal VSC, it's kind of performing similarly. Looking at the same kind of map across the sensitivity cases, um, now I'm just showing the AC case and then the full uh, terawatt miles addition in the, on the left. We see that across a wide range of uh, sensitivity cases, we're, we're getting a pretty similar build out to the, to the, the US um, uh, transmission system. So whether you're looking at low gas price or low hydrogen price or scenarios that include nuclear SMR or more distributed PV, um, you're getting expansion across the U.S. with a lot of density um, in the Midwest connecting to those, those demand centers. Similar stories, again, for that LCC point-to-point -point case um, and then the, the VSC case. Um, you know, we are talking about, uh, at least in terms of what Reed wants to build, these are, you know, multi-tens of gigawatts on uh, between some of these zones, so um, a lot of capacity being added. Um, the other point I'll make is that in all these, uh, both the LCC and the VSC case, we allow AC expansion. But if DC is available, either on these point-to-point -point LCC lines or the, the VSC multi-terminal, the, the, um, in terms of cost, which is really all that REEDS is optimizing over, um, it, it really wants to build DC if you, if you let it. Um, so when, when we're talking about this interregional transmission, then um, even including all the fixed costs of the converters and so forth, 
um, then there's um, uh, DC tends to win out. Win out. So just uh, wrapping up, um, some high level takeaways so far, um, I will emphasize these are all um, interim. We haven't yet done uh, the step of passing these through to more detailed nodal models and then rerunning all the capacity expansion. So these are um, interim so far, but um, things that we can say with fairly high confidence so far is that there is a significant reduction in emissions under the IRA policy, um, but a lot of uncertainty um, and uh, not all the way to zero. So more policies are needed to get to zero carbon. Um, as you'd expect, the combination of high demand growth and 90 or 100% emissions reductions leads to uh, many factors of growth of wind, solar, and storage. Um, actually, the relative uh, growth of transmission, we're talking about 2 or 3x, which um, doesn't sound so bad compared to the 10x or more of solar or wind, um, but you know, still obviously a lot of growth across these technologies. Um, in all the cases, the majority of decarbonization is delivered by wind and solar with coordinated deployment of storage and transmission. So we can argue about the last 10% and um, what is supplying a firm capacity on these systems, but really that first you know, 80% or more, um, where there's high confidence, it's a lot of wind and solar. And so needing to solve that interconnection challenge is, is very important. And then finally, we get transmission additions nationwide um, with in general, the highest density between the wind belt and Eastern interconnection demand centers. And that's true across the AC and different uh, DC cases as well. Um, so I'll, I think I'll stop there. I, you know, the talk today has focused on the kind of why of, of transmission. Um, I didn't mention it here, but you know, initial estimates are hundreds of billions of dollars of benefits of you know, in terms of avoided generation and operational expenses. Um, so that I think we've seen from this study and many others. You know, I'm not. I don't have. Uh, as many insights on the how, I'm interested in learning from the rest of the, the panel and from the discussion as well. Um, but at least, you know, on, on these kind of high level metrics of not needing to build, build tens of gigawatts of, of uh, new technologies we've never deployed before and the kind of system cost savings, there's clear benefits there. Um, so with that, I'll stop. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for inviting me here. Um, I changed my presentation title to the Atlantic Offshore Transmission Effort because I think the study is important piece. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition to really make the offshore transmission uh, build development for uh, addressing near-term and long-term transmission needs. So I'm sharing today is a, a broad view of the offshore transmission effort, including a study. So just a quick plug for wind office. Uh, wind office in wind office, we conduct R&D to reduce the cost of offshore wind, land-based wind, and distributed wind. We invest in research, uh, social science, environmental science research to mitigate um, siting and uh, permitting barriers. We also have this system integration program that I lead uh, that um, identify solutions to interconnect and integrate in increasing levels of wind timely, reliably, and resiliently. So um, U.S. offshore wind is U.S. in the cusp of offshore wind industry boom. I really mean it now. Uh, although we only have 40, 20, 42 megawatt and only seven wind turbines in operation, we have a robust pipeline of uh, 40 gigawatts of offshore wind on the different phases of project development. Most of those are driven by uh, our state commitment um, in, in the East Coast uh, that already uh, accumulated to 39 gigawatt. West Coast is also um, uh, catching up on their momentum. Uh, this July, uh, after several rounds of stakeholder, uh, stakeholder uh, briefings, California CEC announced 25 gigawatt by 2045 planning goals. Considering California is uh, having deep water in, in the West Coast, this is very aggressive planning targets. Uh, federal government uh, in March 2021 last year, White House announced a 30 gigawatt by 2030 goals and uh, achieving that will um, uh, pave a pathway to achieving 110 and gigawatt or more by 2050. Last month, uh, DOE announced this floating offshore wind shot and set aggressive cost reduction goal for floating offshore wind uh, that intends to achieve more than 70% of cost reduction by 2035. In the meantime, Department of Interior announced the 15 gigawatt of floating offshore wind by 2035. Um, so the numbers are great, uh, but converting the numbers into real steel uh, in the water, we're facing a lot of challenges. One of this is how do we build those transmission uh, for both onshore and offshore. So um, the state are taking actions. Some of you have talked to me about New Jersey's announcement today. 
they announced their uh, SAA project selection. Um, I think some of folks are disappointed that they are less aggressive in choosing a shared, uh, shared transmission infrastructure offshore. But I think they made some historical move by uh, proactively building onshore transmission for offshore interconnection and also adopt this shared transmission corridor so that they have uh, mini they can minimize the uh, transmission uh, environmental impact. Uh, New York, uh, in their third offshore um, procurement, um, finally disclosed their meshed grid design, which translates to uh, HVDC point-to-point -point in the connection uh, for future uh, offshore transmission, offshore um, projects. But then the system can be connected to form an AC offshore transmission grid. New, New England five states announced a, a request for information uh, last month. Um, the, in that RFI, they proposed a modular, uh, modular plan that their module is a 1200, 1200 megawatt HVDC, 500, 525 kV HVDC module. And their goal is, their intention is future trans, offshore transmission can, can be connected as a standard component and easy to plug and play. The federal government, DOE and the uh, uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management started a, a coordinated offshore transmission effort uh, in 2021. Our goal is to identify a planned approach to address uh, Atlantic offshore transmission uh, needs for both near-term and, and long-term deployment. We started from a, a mapping exercise that helped us understand where the gaps are and uh, what federal government can help. We're done with that. Um, so this year we started a two a parallel effort. First is a set of convening workshops. Some of you might already uh, participate in some of that. Uh, this work, this series of workshops, uh, we are conducting in-depth technical uh, conversation with those folks who live and breathe those issues. Um, so we hope whatever come out of those efforts, um, that will be meaningful and useful to our industry. In the meantime, uh, WINOP has kicked off this Atlantic Offshore Transmission Analysis. This analysis is led by a national lab. Um, one of the purposes is we provide interim results to inform the convening workshop conversations and inform the final recommendations, which we, we are planning to um, write, uh, release those uh, early uh, recommendations early next spring, and then um, update those recommendations after completion of the transmission analysis. With all the recommendations, we plan to implement and assess how effective those recommendations are. Uh, if proven useful, we are, we are going to replicate this process for the West Coast and for other coastal regions. So let's just walk back to um, the scoping uh, and gap analysis. Um, in summer of last year, we spent three months talking to 20 plus um, entities, including tribal nations, federal, uh, federal agencies, private industry, um, NGOs, state, uh, state, uh, state energy office, and POCs. Uh, the conversation is quite broad. We summarize into this pie chart. So you yeah, can see a lot of uh, conversations are um, planning, uh, transmission planning improvements. Um, people uh, voice their concerns and ask, you know, we need to know how to allocate the transmission costs. We need to address the siting, uncertainty in siting timelines. We need to, um, uh, facilitate state, um, state and uh, federal uh, co collaboration. Other topics include, you know, um, lacking data and uh, don't know how to do studies. Uh, we, we have supply chain needs as globally, many other countries also are ramping up their offshore industry. Um, there are risks to development, especially uh, project by project based risk if we going uh, towards this shell transmission um, approach. And then other comments include, we need to learn international experience. Thanks Charlie for inviting guests from Europe. And also education, we need a lot of education um, and, and um, improve the workforce. Um, then followed up that, DOE published this Atlantic Offshore Wind Transmission Literature Review and Gap Analysis Report. Uh, you can download this report from the link here. Um, so this report, we, to, to, uh, we reviewed 20 plus uh, reports on transmission that has some offshore elements in that. So we identified a few gaps in, the, in those reports that we reviewed. First is most of the reports only study single state, single region. Um, 
they have various study years based on you know their their offshore deployment goals. Um, a lot of the, those studies only ends at economic study. They really any they don't do any offshore transmission uh, study. They only look at they have no environmental impact uh, consideration and no very few on reliability, not to mention re, uh, resilience. Um, together, I think with all the uh, scoping and gap analysis, I, I, I want to summarize a little bit of our um, key challenges. So uh, the current process of building transmission for offshore is a passive interconnection based approach. Uh, as we know that our coastal uh, grid are not that strong, with lower voltage and far from the backbone, we are only have we only have very limited uh, capacity we are called part of interconnections for offshore wind. So first the settle project will take those best POIs and best uh, landing points, then that hinders the, uh, uh, the future offshore wind um, without um, having to pay hefty onshore upgrade cost. And then um, the environmental impacts. If we do all, if every single wind farm connects to their individual point of interconnections, we are going to end up with spaghetti like offshore cables, and that um, is less than ideal as we learn some lessons from the UK experience. And the last is the proactive development it brings project on project based uh, risks. As we know some lessons learned from our European partners and saying, you know, individual projects is waiting, if it's waiting for, um, for the shared infrastructure to build, then that may lose the momentum of offshore wind industry. So with that, uh, DOE and BOEM kicked off this a series of convening workshops that discussed three, t three key areas. First on planning and development. Uh, we, we discussed uh, how do we select best point, point of attentions, what the future transmission topology would look like in offshore. Uh, we discussed about uh, what's a business model, uh, what's, uh, what are the future policy would be to incentivize interregional transmission, incentivize um, shared infrastructure, incentivize proactive transmission build out. We talk about how we can reduce uncertainty and, and uncertainty in permitting and citing uh, for the offshore transmission. Um, the DOE's Atlantic Offshore Wind Transmission Study was kicked off, was initiated um, in November 2021. We, our goal is to really conduct com comprehensive transmission analysis that industry has not been doing by themselves. So we, 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 are, we are identifying a different pathways to achieving a near term uh, transmission, offshore transmission deployment goals, and also considering uh, grid operability, reliability and resilience and environmental impacts. The study itself, we, uh, we create, we formed a very robust uh, technical review committee. We have more than 100 members already who help um, provide their uh, insights into um, whether our approach makes sense, whether our models and data have gaps and help us review our interim results. We, we are lined up with uh, five technical tasks. Most of you are familiar with, you're starting from transmission expansion planning, followed by production cost modeling. And one unique element of our studies, we have this uh, task four that focus on understanding the cost of different technologies, understanding uh, what are the environmental impacts if when we design our offshore topologies. Uh, we also um, have this very robust reliability analysis that I'll cover a little bit more in detail. And then um, we, do, we will do resilience and extreme weather impacts uh, to understand what's the, the extreme weather impacts to offshore wind and to the onshore grid. So the current status, um, so far we have identified two core uh, capacity expansion scenarios. One is business as usual. The other is the, um, the low carbon scenario. Um, for the low carbon scenario, we settled down about 85 gigawatt by 85 gigawatt by 2050 for the Atlantic region. We collected 27 layers of offshore siting data. And those siting data is rendered into a siting map that uh, enable us to develop a optimal cable routing um, algorithm. So the, the map to the right is illustrative. So you can see the transmission lines is no longer a straight line from point A to point B. Rather, it considers the siting constraints that we identified through those 27 uh, layers of siting data. We collected 
cost of subsea cables, including AC and DC, and HVDC converter stations and HVDC breakers. We identify four offshore transmission topologies. Um, first is the baseline uh, radio point-to-point -point transmission lines. Second is uh, uh, intra-regional transmission build-out. Third is inter-regional transmission that connects uh, two regions together. And then last is a backbone that connects from New England all the way to South Carolina. My apology, I wasn't able to show the, any of the topologies uh, today. Uh, so uh, one thing I had to point out is uh, all of those studies, all of those scenarios have HVDT lines. Some have multi-terminal mesh to DC grid. Uh, right now we are working on production cost modeling so we can know better about the operability of each of the topology designs. Uh, we finished the contingency analysis for 2030 scenarios. We are actually working on contingency analysis for 2050. We started the weak grid evaluation and working on stability of a future grid with mix of DC and AC. Uh, we are uh, working on extreme events identification with our TRC members to prepare for their resilience analysis. Just want to tell you that our next TRC meeting is actually just the next week. So if you want to participate and learn more about the up-to-date results, just let me know. All right, with that, thank you. And next we have Hassan Hyatt, and then we'll have some time for some questions. Is my audio okay? All right. So who, who all is tired? Okay, at least you guys are honest. Good. Uh, well, let's get started. Uh, I understand I'm the uh, I'm standing between between you all and, and being done for the day. Uh, but thank you for sticking around. Uh, I'll also tell tell everybody that my presentation is not going to be based on analysis uh, numbers. A lot of the good things that you know my fellow uh, panelists shared today. Uh, because I don't think this is a technical problem. I don't think this is an economic problem. I think this is a problem which is, uh, which is related to policy. Uh, and, and, and that's why I wanted to talk more in general and, and not so much about the analysis. I'm Hassan Hayat. Uh, I work for uh, American Electric Power. Uh, I just wanted to uh, quickly share this map uh, with you all, what you see in dark red. Uh, is AP and the uh, load uh, area that we serve. Uh, we are, and why did why, why do I want to share that? I wanted to share that is because uh, you know this is uh, we show we, we saw the uh, European uh, grid map earlier today. So we we have a similar issue here in the U.S. as well, where we have multiple regions, multiple balancing authorities, uh, and uh, uh, it it just gets very. Uh, complex, complicated, uh, if, if the regions and balancing uh, authorities don't coordinate on actionable uh, planning, which we also uh, like to call as interregional transmission planning. Uh, really quick, AEP is part of uh, four uh, regional transmission uh, organizations, PJM, MISO, SPP, and ERCOT. We serve about five and a half million customers. Uh, we have assets in 11 states. Uh, we operate 26 uh, gigawatts of generation, uh, and we have a transmission uh, that is a little over 40,000 miles. What is our motivation? Uh, so first and foremost, uh, we think uh, interregional transmission planning is important because it will bring uh, tremendous uh, benefits to the customers. There is a lot of literature out there that talks about uh, transmission, uh, interregional transmission and uh, benefits. And I'm not gonna get into that detail, but I will in those details, but I will mention one specific study that was done uh, last year uh, by uh, Grid Strategies, uh, which basically estimated $1 billion of savings. Uh, if there was a, if there was one gigawatt of transmission capacity into Texas, 
from, uh, from the Southeast US. And by the way, uh, that transmission would have paid for itself in four days uh, during winter storm URI. In addition to that, uh, you know, we are familiar with uh, a lot of the state objectives, uh, various rene renewable portfolio standards that are out there. There's a lot of uh, utility uh, integrated resource plans or IRPs that are out there. Uh, and there's a lot of other uh, type of, uh, you know, emission goals, uh, carbon reduction goals that, that a lot of the entities uh, and stakeholders, the really important stakeholders in the US have. Uh, and we think, uh, I think that if all of these entities continue to operate in, uh, in their silos, in isolation, uh, the customers, people like us, will only end up uh, paying more. So it's very important for uh, transmission planning uh, to be uh, coordinated, consolidated, uh, and really done at an interregional level so that the true benefits uh, can be uh, brought uh, to the customers. We've heard a lot about changes. Uh, uh, we, we are going through unprecedented times where our, our grid is, uh, is experiencing a lot of changes. The, the, the generation fuel mix is, is changing. We, we, we saw a lot of lovely uh, illustrations on that uh, today and yesterday as well. Uh, customer appetite for electric vehicles is growing uh, day by day. Uh, our grid faces extreme challenges uh, concerning extreme weather and also cyber and physical threats. Uh, in addition to that, the war in Ukraine has only highlighted uh, the, uh, 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 the, the volatile nature of uh, generation fuel supply. So to count for all of these factors uh, and to plan for a grid, uh, which is grid of the future, which is more which is resilient uh, and, and, and is able to accommodate and plan around. Very important that we uh, uh, move forward uh, into regional transmission planning. There's a lot of additional benefits, but I'm gonna uh, stick to these for now. But if it sounds so important, if it sounds so fancy, and needed, why is it not moving forward? Because there's a lot of barriers. Uh, and like I said, I don't think a lot of these barriers are technical in nature. They're not even economic in nature. Uh, they're just uh, policy tariff uh, requirements related uh, challenges that are preventing uh, development of interregional transmission planning. Some, some of the barriers that we you know, see uh, is you know the, the transmission planning horizon is not uh, is not uh, uh, forward looking enough. Uh, a lot of the regions plan their system between five to ten years. Uh, some regions, right, MISO do do go ahead and 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 take uh, a twenty year outlook. So we think that's a limiting factor. Uh, uh, a lot of the regions and the balancing authorities in the U.S. they have a uh, single uh, transmission planning scenario which is often known as business as usual scenario. Uh, others have multiple scenarios, but some of those scenarios are really uh, conservative, uh, really conservative in nature. Uh, as an example, uh, I'll, I'll state uh, two years ago, uh, SPP, when they performed their uh, integrated uh, transmission planning assessments, the, uh, the wind amounts uh, that were assumed uh, in those uh, study cases was lower than what existed in SPP at the time. Now they've done tremendous work uh, since then, and the and the future uh, the scenarios that are being developed are reasonable. Uh, I wish I could say aggressive, but they are reasonable, uh, and and that's really a barrier. Uh, uh, the conservative nature of those scenarios is a is a barrier. I talked about uh, the, the the transmission benefits. Uh, that are not uh, completely taken into consideration today. Uh, and, and, and oftentimes we are left with situation where those needs are not addressed. Uh, those opportunities are not fully uh, uh, taken care of. 
most importantly, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the, the biggest barrier is there, is there is no requirement. There is no mandatory requirement at the FERC level uh, for regions, for balancing authorities, for entities to perform uh, interregional planning. But what happens is uh, oftentimes uh, great projects are, are held, uh, 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 they're, they're, de they're denied approval or they're delayed uh, in the various regulatory processes. So that's definitely a barrier. I'll, I'll come back to the uh, cost allocation uh, uh, in the next slide, but I, I do see that to be as a barrier because uh, regions don't, don't agree on uh, cost allocation practices because uh, who pays for all of this uh, investment, all of this development is, 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 a, is, is really an elephant in the room. Okay, how can we move forward? Uh, by extending the planning horizon. Uh, FERC has, by the way, done some uh, excellent work. Uh, they have issued a lot of uh, NOPERS. Uh, I see a lot of, some, some head shaking in the room, so I can tell some people have worked on them. So a lot of this is in FERC's radar, and, and, I'm, and we're really hopeful that there's some activity uh, on that front, uh, hopefully soon. Uh, Planning, uh, planning scenarios uh, need, to be, uh, need to be adopted consistently uh, across all regions, all balancing authorities in the, uh, in the, in the United States. And what do, I, uh, what do I mean by that? What, I'm, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, first of all, we need to make sure that the business as usual scenario is, is, is reasonable. Uh, it's not conservative, it's reason, reasonably forward-looking. Uh, we need to have scenarios that take into consideration uh, DER penetration amounts, electrification, uh, demand and energy growth, uh, carbon reduction uh, goals, uh, utility IRPs, uh, utility generation retirement plans, and, and, and more, most importantly, uh, weather-based events. Uh, now, I'm not proposing that we come up with 10 different scenarios, but at least we need to have uh, more than one. Uh, so that we can we can identify additional needs and, and move those move those forward. There's also a need uh, to establishing, uh, and I think I saw that in uh, a couple of slides uh, today and, and yesterday. Uh, definitely today was there's a need to establish minimum interregional transfer capability especially uh, under, uh, and here's, let me, let me expand on that a little bit. Why is that important? Uh, you know, what, what we're seeing is, uh, what we're seeing is uh, uh, extreme weather events don't have, don't respect the RTO electrical boundary, right? Uh, they impact multiple regions at the same time. Uh, multiple regions sometimes at the same time for same frequency, different duration, uh, or, or different frequency, but everybody's impacted by it. Uh, and if we have minimum uh, transfer capability between regions, uh, one, need your, one region can help out and rescue the neighboring uh, region uh, in, in the time of need. But if we don't plan for that, uh, we don't know what capability uh, will be there when, when the need uh, arises. The costs, they need to be allocated based on beneficiary pays construct. Once we identify all of the transmission needs, uh, a way to fund that is whoever is benefiting from that broader set of transmission need should also be uh, paying for the needs uh, so that we're able to get uh, more buy-in uh, from stakeholders and from regulatory bodies. I'll conclude by saying three things. Uh, interregional transmission planning is important. It's needed uh, because it holds the key to planning a more resilient grid. Interregional transmission planning standard needs to be a requirement. It needs to be a mandatory requirement so that actionable plans are coming out of these studies. And we don't end up in situations where we do studies after study after study and uh, nothing gets done at the end of the day. With that, I'll conclude.